Thank you for the opportunity to present on this topic of port strategies for robotic assisted lung resection. My name is Daniel O. Oh. I'm a thoracic surgeon on faculty at the University of Southern California. For full disclosure, I also work part-time for Intuitive as a medical advisor. Port placement is a very important topic uh, for all surgeons in all specialties, but in thoracic surgery in particular. It is a common source of concern for surgeons, especially those learning uh, robotic surgery. This is because the chest wall is unforgiving due to the unforgiving and unflexible nature of the rib cage. This is true for thoracotomy and for bats, and there is concern that this is true for robotics. The other thing is that residents in particular see that there is a lot of variability in the way their attendings do certain types of procedures. So for a given robotic lobectomy between two different attending surgeons, they see it done two different ways. It becomes unclear which details are actually important to the case and which ones are just personal idiosyncrasies. So the fundamental question is, can we identify common themes or fundamental tenets about port placement for robotic lung resection? Well, as anyone would do when first asking a question, uh, the immediate thing to do at that point is to go to YouTube. And when you talk about port placement, the search term is actually, how do you skin a cat? And as you can see here, or well, actually, I'm not gonna show the video because um, we wanna be compliant to any type of uh, animal cruelty uh, regulations. But um, just like you would see in a video for port placement, you're gonna have just as many supporters as you are detractors and maybe even more thumbs down than thumbs up. What we actually did was a survey study of high volume surgeons. And I worked with a couple of other surgeons as well as some researchers. And we did a survey study. We first tested it out in the AATS Foundation Fellowship Group in 2017. We refined the, the survey and uh, we sent it then to 100 of the highest volume robotic thoracic surgeons in the United States. We included in the survey actually more than just port strategies, uh, but also instrument preferences and perioperative management. And the port placement portion of that study was published uh, last year in 2019, as, as shown on the right side. 62 out of the 100 surgeons surveyed completed the entire um, study. Um, this did require for port strategy, looking at a diagram of a chest wall for both the right and the left and to put all of the port sites in specific inner spaces by dragging and dropping a port uh, using a mouse. In this group, a median of 159 robotic lobectomies had been done in the prior three years before the survey was completed and the range went all the way up to 674 cases during that time period. One of the things that's notable about any type of robotic lobectomy survey or study is that we have to acknowledge there are different types of robotic lobectomy. On the top uh, row, you can see Da Vinci SI and XI. I think all of you uh, in the audience are using Da Vinci XI at this point. On the um, vertical axis, you can see the acronyms of RPL and RAL. And if you're not familiar with this terminology, I would refer you to a paper from Serfolio and others, which was a consensus uh, document uh, trying to get some uni uni uniformity in a nomenclature of robotic lobectomy. The R stands for robotic, P is for port-based, A is for access incision, and L is for lobectomy. The number that follows is either three arms or four arms. Port-based is pretty self-explanatory. It's all port-based, including the um, uh, incision for the uh, assistant and CO2 insufflation is administered. An access incision would be to make a small opening, usually with a wound protector and CO2 insufflation cannot be done. What is uh, apparent though, despite these variabilities is that the vast majority of surgeons are using forearms on an XI. And so we will discuss details related to this type of setup for the remainder of the talk. Uh, 
when we looked at the survey responses for, let's say, a forearm technique of a right upper lobe, what we saw was this that generally speaking, not many of the responses were very similar. Although there are some potential themes that you could potentially identify. To make sense of this, we thought, well, let's organize it by the number of interspaces that the uh, ports are placed. Because theoretically, when robotic lobectomy was first started, people wondered whether there would be less pain if you kept, the inter if you kept all the ports in the same interspace. But what we found is that single interspace was just as commonly used as two interspaces, and that was just as commonly used as three interspaces. So it's probably doubtful that where you put the actual ports is contributing a lot to pain. Otherwise, surgeons would have uh, boiled down their strategy to um, going to a single interspace or maybe two at most. But this does not seem to be the case. So to further identify any kind of common themes, as was our initial intent, uh, we created a heat map. And this is uh, what it looks like for the right-sided approach. And as you can see, we made a map for right upper lobe, middle lobe, and lower lobe. And what's shown is that red is going to be the most commonly chosen location, and purple is going to be the least common. And it's hard to see here, but I drew arrows to indicate the seventh inner space and the eighth inner space. Now for the right upper lobe, what is apparent is that there is a little bit of a split between surgeon's preferences of either putting the camera in the seventh inner space or eighth inner space. When you get to the middle and lower lobe, however, uh, it's more consistent. Almost everyone is going eighth or rather the majority of people are going into the eighth. And definitely by the time you get to the lower lobe, most people are putting the camera in the eighth inner space. The other notable thing is to see uh, how the response for the posterior port is. With all three of these lobectomies, you can see a great deal of variability. And I would say this is the port with the greatest amount of difference between surgeons. Um, and I think ultimately what we concluded is that most surgeons are not really using the external landmarks to put this port in, and I'll explain a little bit more why later. The other thing to notice is the anterior port, which in a right-sided approach is going to be your stapler as well as your dissecting hand if you're right-handed. And most people are going in the seventh inner space, even for the middle lobe and the lower lobe. So even though the camera is going into the eighth inner space, the anterior port is typically going in the seventh inner space. And so we repeated this process for the left-sided approach, and you can see similar themes. Left upper lobe, left lower lobe, the camera port kind of split between seventh and eighth inner space, but for the lower lobe, pretty much everyone's going in the eighth inner space. A lot of variability in that posterior port again, and also some um, difference uh, in the um, left-handed port this time, which is still the anterior port. But you can see the seventh inner space is still the most uh, commonly chosen option. So if we conclude based off these heat diagrams, we can make a little schematic. And this is really a template. Uh, this is not a, um, a recipe to follow to the T, but this is a template uh, that is drawn from using these heat maps that we derived. And what it's showing here is for the right and the left side of the approach, most people are going in the eighth inner space, sometimes seventh inner space, um, and that's holding true for the left side as well. I would say most surgeons that we talk to nowadays are going into the eighth inner space regardless of the lobe that they're doing, whether it's lower, middle, or upper. Now, you do see in this diagram uh, instrument preferences. Uh, this was part of the study. Uh, I didn't show you the data in terms of, you know, how often each uh, surgeon uh, was picking which instrument, but this was uh, by majority rules, the consensus. Uh, the posterior instrument is typically the tip-up grasper. Uh, the left hand, which is the retracting hand or exposing hand, uh, is uh, Cartier. Uh, and most people use a bipolar energy uh, device in their uh, dissecting hand. Uh, the long bipolar grasper is the most common uh, these days. And then finally, you can see the stapler can actually be put in anteriorly or posteriorly. Uh, 
So we, you have to be mindful to plan ahead if you want um, to put the ports in yourself before docking so that you're not wasting time later to put a 12 millimeter trocar anteriorly and a 12 millimeter trocar here um, second to most posteriorly if you want a anterior and posterior stapling um, angle. The other thing that's noticed here is this light pink area. It's not actually a port site, but this is generally speaking where the assistant port would go. Didn't really draw an assistant port uh, per se because this has actually evolved over time, I would say, for most surgeons. In the beginning, uh, when robotics uh, was first uh, getting traction with lobectomy, most people would put the assistant port uh, anteriorly, often um, uh, near the diaphragm and triangulating between, uh, in this example, three and four, the camera port and the anterior port, or on the left side between one and two, which is the anterior port and the camera port again. Uh, what's become apparent though over the past, I would say two years um, and increasing is that um, people are starting to push that assistant port more posteriorly. Um, and uh, there are a couple of reasons why I think that's happening. Number one, there's more space when you go a little bit more posteriorly. And oftentimes it ends up in line with the camera. And as long as you use a zero degree camera that typically doesn't cause any problems. A 30 degree camera can cause some issues though because the trajectory of that camera is coming in kind of flat. And so I would say dealer's choice on where exactly you put the uh, assistant port. Now, I want to bring your attention to this paper from uh, Dr. Serfolio. And he has an interesting rule that I wanted to point out. Um, it's hard to see, but in this paper, you can look it up here, the reference. Um, but he has right side SI, left side SI, and right side XI, and left side XI. So for the purpose of this discussion, we're focusing on XI. But what's hard to read is that he, he has what's called a 488 rule. And the, the principle is that you measure four centimeters from the spine, from the midline of the spine, four centimeters. That's going to be your mo most posterior port. Then you go eight centimeters to your next, and then eight centimeters to your next and then the maximum distance to the final port anteriorly, which is typically where the diaphragm inserts into the chest wall. And if you use that 488 rule, it is a nice rule of thumb of where to put that camera port. Um, if you add four plus eight plus eight, it's 20 centimeters. So if you measure 20 centimeters along the rib, that's generally speaking for an average size patient, uh, the dome of the chest. Um, and so, uh, that's typically uh, what I do is I, I'll measure 20 centimeters, but you, know, you could pretty much eyeball it with experience. But that is a nice uh, quantifiable way to um, map out where to put your ports. Uh, and that is a nice rule of thumb because the eight centimeters between ports uh, minimizes uh, collisions. So how do I put my ports? Um, so first of all, I'll put my camera port and I'll put it in the eighth inner space. Quite honestly, for an upper lobe, I will put the camera in the seventh inner space because I use a zero degree camera and I look, like to look right over the top of the hilum and look down and dissect down on the pulmonary artery um, in that uh, area. Um, once I put the camera port, I um, uh, am going to decide where to put that in using the 488 rule. Sometimes another trick is if it's hard to count the inner space, just identify the level of the xiphoid and just draw a horizontal line that's pretty much going to be your eighth inner space. Another nice rule is uh, using the tip of the scapula is um, oftentimes uh, the first inner space right below is the seventh inner space. So you can march forward and then count one rib space down if you're not sure. So once I enter the seventh slash eighth inner space, um, I confirm I'm in the chest. I should be below the fissure. That is the perspective I prefer to see again with a zero degree camera. And then once I know I'm safely in the chest, we'll start insufflating CO2. And I'd like to set my pressure at eight millimeters mercury pressure. The next step is to put the posterior port. So the way I do this is I look with the camera at the lower lobe and identify the superior segment, S6. I want that um, port, the posterior port, to come out at the level of S6. But also importantly, I look for the paraspinous ligament and I want to stay medial to that. If you go too far posteriorly, uh, you're going to run out of room uh, for that posterior arm uh, 
uh, to retract the lung, especially elevating the lung is difficult with that arm if you go too far posteriorly. The nice thing about going at the level of S6 or the superior segment is that the arm is coming in posterior to the hilum, gives you a nice um, way to uh, cradle the lung and pull it posteriorly when you do the anterior exposure or push that uh, hilum forward uh, to give you a, a really nice posterior exposure. Next, I'll put the left hand port in this example here on the uh, right side of the approach. I basically split the difference, but again, if you use the 488 rule, you'll be eight centimeters in between uh, one and two, as well as between two and three. If you are gonna staple here, this has to be a 12 millimeter trocar. Now in a small patient, if you aren't sure, I would err on putting this port lower rather than higher. And so go ahead and drop this port down because you need room to clear the joint of the stapler uh, in a small patient so that you can staple uh, with enough space. Finally, the right-hand port, I typically go in the seventh inner space, even if my camera's in the eighth inner space. Uh, this is gonna be pretty much um, by uh, pulling the camera out, going into the posterior port, looking forward. We'll put that under direct vision. The port will generally be in line with the fissure and um, uh, that's a nice stapling angle. And this will be a 12 millimeter for all lobectomies because we will be stapling with that port. And later we will enlarge uh, the anterior port, not the assistant port uh, for specimen extraction. The reason for this is that um, surgeons have sort of evolved their thinking about removing the specimen down low uh, with concern that you may be stretching the intercostal nerve as it comes off the 11th rib towards the rectus muscle. It's not um, protected by a rib, and so the specimen might be stretching that nerve uh, traumatically, causing some superior rectus uh, muscle dysfunction. So many surgeons are now extracting the specimen out of this anterior port here, uh, where the nerve is typically protected by the ribs. Finally, I'll put my assistant port, again, keeping the camera posteriorly looking towards the front. Uh, and I typically go at least two inner spaces away from the robotic port. Most of the time, I would say my assistant is vertically in line with the camera port. And uh, as I mentioned, we avoid removing the specimen here. With that, uh, we can take some time for questions and discussion and um, I would like to provide you with one additional resource on how to put in ports, which is this uh, nice article from the New York Times Magazine on how to skin a cat. Thank you for your attention.